When the market goes down, if I have money saved, what should I do with my money? I should buy. This is Dave Meltzer with Entrepreneur. I'm so excited to have Troy Murphy. Dave. Ex-NBA star, 12 years in the league, first round draft pick. Most importantly though, humanitarian and philanthropist, which most people don't know. And you got to play for the unbelievable franchise, the dynasty, the Golden State Warriors. Sure. Which uh, is what you, where you grew up, you said. Anyway, um, now as a basketball player or any athlete, most athletes are not known for their intellectual capabilities, especially basketball players, because they don't even have to go to college. True. And you're someone that not only went to college, but went back to college and graduated with, on the dean's list from an Ivy League school, Columbia. Sure. How much do you think your education helped you in your professional basketball career? I think it was definitely a benefit. Um, it allowed me to look at things from a different perspective, just have a, a multitude of experiences from, from going to that kind of more traditional um, academic environment and then coming in and playing in the NBA. It gives you a different perspective and, and kind of broadens your horizons. So it was, it was significant for me. It was definitely helpful. Do you ever feel, and a lot of the athletes that I had that went to the Ivy Leagues that really took their studies seriously as a primary focus, a lot of times they felt separate from the rest of the team because they were interested in other things than their teammates were interested off the court. Was that ever a challenge for you? Not really. When I was playing basketball, I was pretty much singularly focused on basketball. Um, and I was thinking in the off season ways to improve. I really spent my time as a basketball player trying to maximize my career, maximize whatever potential that I had and trying to reach that potential. So I really focused on that. But since finishing up, then I've you know kind of transitioned out of that for sure. And you did stay focused on basketball, but yet you, your whole life's mission now is to help financial literacy of people. You make no money for it. Yeah. You have a huge foundation and you have a huge cause to help preserve wealth in our athletes. Mm -hmm. um, but while you were playing, you weren't really uh, on the financial side studying or you know, reading the Wall Street Journal or... No, I wasn't, but what I was doing was I was kind of going through a process of trying to figure out a way to manage this financial landscape that I was kind of put into. Um, and it just gave me a, uh, like, more so than studying from learning from a book, I was learning firsthand how to do things, what to do, what not to do, what was sustainable, and how to kind of set myself up for the future. So I had, I kind of learned as I went along, and now trying to impart some of those kind of lessons that I learned and help people take a more direct route to whatever financial independence that they might be looking for. And I find you know, I come from a very academic uh, family, six kids, I'm the only one that didn't go to the Ivy Leagues, but I find that just because you're educated in school or going to the Ivy Leagues has nothing to do with the situational knowledge of how to maintain wealth, yeah. gain wealth, yeah. grow wealth, uh, and those lessons that you learn did you learn only through your own experience or did you take on mentorship while you were playing? You know, I learned kind of through my own experience. I had a number of experiences that were um, some good, some bad, but I think, you know, you'd kind of aggregate all those experiences and try to formulate a plan and, you know, an identity of what you wanted to do. And then since um, I finished playing, I was able to spend more time trying to find something like a mentor, or somebody that was trying to help me. I was able to find that and, and kind of, when you have that, you, you get an extra boost of confidence to, to kind of, you know, really figure out where you want to go and it gives you the impetus to, to make the necessary changes, so yeah. There's two things that I have found to be the biggest challenges of making a lot of money, regardless of whether you're an athlete or not. One is the feeling that you are responsible for people. Sure. Yeah, I think it's a huge issue. A lot of people don't talk about it, but the people that succeed feel very blessed. They're usually very grateful, regardless if in sports or not. And a lot of times we don't even feel worthy of all that we have. Yeah. And so what happens is we get taken advantage of by those people that we feel responsible for. Yeah. And we can't understand the balance of, you know, making sure my mom's okay sure. compared to 
you know, making sure my mom is living like, you know, Queen Latifah in a mansion and yeah. spending all my money. Yeah. Um, is that an issue still today, do you see? That is the number one issue. It's an enormous issue. You hit it right on the head. Um, when people come and, you know, people come to me or just conversations that I've had in the past or things that I've had to deal with, like you have to be able to manage these expectations from friends, family members, and things like that. And it's not a selfish thing to say that you have to take care of yourself first. I mean, you have a contract, you have a short, compact earning, you know, window. And if you go and, like you said, take care of family members, that's going to be something that you'll be able to do for a couple of years. But what this opportunity and, you know, having a sports contract should do is it should be able to sustain itself for a lifetime. And that's where a lot of guys make mistakes is they're not willing to have those tough conversations or not willing to kind of temper these expectations. And, you know, that's a big problem. What piece of advice do you give? I know, you know, there's many different options of how to say no to people. Yeah. Do you have any specific advice that you can give people about what the best mechanism is? Yeah, and the thing is like people will go through these, these situations where they'll have a canned response. It's like a canned response sounds great, but you have, you know, you have these emotional ties. You have people that have entitlement, um, they have expectations, and just giving them a canned response is not something that's going to work. So just being able to sit down and be honest with somebody, um, the willingness to have a tough conversation, those are things that I try to point people towards. And, and they're difficult to have, but you know, these are things that come with the responsibility of a sudden wealth situation that you have to really sit down and take advantage of. You make a phenomenal point because a lot of people they have either a canned response or a canned process, meaning, you know, I just tell people you got to talk to my financial guy, yeah. but that doesn't work when it's, you know, your aunt, yes. or, right, or your yeah, mom, or exactly. your sister, or your brother. And so, you know, I think it's really important for people to hear that, that you have to literally let people know, I can't give you what I don't have, and if I put myself at a detriment, not only won't I ever be able to help you again, but even worse, I won't be able to help myself, yeah. and then I'll be coming to you for a load. Exactly. <laughs> that no, that really has happened, right? You're absolutely right, I and mean, that happens more times than it should, and it shouldn't happen. Um, but also, you know, you mentioned the point of the canned response of sending someone to a financial advisor. It's like, you know, you can't send someone to the financial advisor because, you know, this is someone who you just met. Like, you're putting the burden on them, and you have to, I mean, there has to be checks and balances. You have to know what this person is trying to get out of you as well. So. I mean, you really have to take the responsibility to manage this thing yourself. You don't have to know exactly. You have to know what each investment, what each thing that you're putting, place you're putting your money in, you have to know what the, the point is within your overall portfolio. Yeah, and the second issue that I found is one that you briefly touched on when we first started is that, and I think this is true of everyone, they, they always do things in the instant. They, where people bow to motion for logical reasons but they don't know what they want, mm -hmm. right? And in the financial realm, I think it's so important, e even for me, I'm someone that made a tremendous amount of money at a young age. I lost a tremendous amount of money in my 30s and regained it. And I think the key component was that first part, learning to say no myself. Yeah. And two, once I decided this is my objective financially, yeah. right? Do I have a 10, a 20 year, a 30 year plan? You know, what kind of house do I want? What kind of car do I, you know, all these little things and then reverse engineer it backwards saying, here's the different products, services and solutions sure. and the amount of money that I have to make each year minimum in order to effectuate what I'm trying to do. Mm -hmm. how, how many athletes do you think actually do that? Zero. <laughs> Zero? Zero. I think the thing that we try to get is we'll try to get somebody just to not make decisions or not make knee-jerk kind of reactions financially right off the bat. Like take the time to think about what you want, take the time to think about the purpose you have for this money before you kind of go back and, you know, like you said, go back and figure out how much you need. But, you know, people are not doing that right off the bat. People are thinking, you know, it's like the lottery winnings, you know, hey, you never know. And people say, you know, daydream and, and that's what you're doing, except that daydream becomes reality. And you have the opportunity to purchase things to, you know, set people up financially. And, you know, you're not thinking about these things and you're not taking the time and you want to go right off the bat. And that's where mistakes are made. A lot of people today, you know, watch podcasts, watch videos, etc. But I believe there's still some really good books out there. Mm -hmm. Whether you listen to Audible or you read them. Yeah. What book would you recommend to someone that can really help guide you through some of this? A financial book would be Millionaire Next Door. Um, Great book. Classic. Just, you know, take your time getting through it, understanding, you know, the different aspects of it. But there are, there are a number of great um, books that are out there. Um, 
but that that's one that I've you know kept by the bedside and probably I mean I've got dog-eared underlined <laughs> things the Thinking covers ripped off yeah I mean exactly yeah stuff like that so yeah yeah now um, you created a foundation actually to help us as people is that right is it well it's a, a um, it's a financial advisory firm and we donate 100% of our proceeds to financial literacy organizations so we donated uh, we've identified two donation recipients and whatever we make we just give to them and they are consumer awareness financial literacy and do you think financial literacy should be taught how early in school I mean financial literacy should be taught right off you know right off the bat with everything I mean like you said I had a tremendous opportunity I went to a fantastic high school went to some of the best colleges that you can go to and you know there are no financial literacy classes there's no financial None. literacy programs I mean I had a unique experience where I was able to leave school early but at the same time how do you know what to do I mean I know you know I went and I studied the you know and I love English literature but I studied the Canterbury you know Canterbury Tales and <laughs> things like that but and it's great yeah but at the end of the day I don't know how much that's really helping me you know so I think there should be a, a definite um, financial literacy program and financial literacy classes that are mandated by you know high schools universities things like that because our financial literacy level is quite low as a you know yeah. population absolutely man. and it's only going to help the innovation and sustenance of our country by making the average person more financially literate and responsible to that matter I found it extremely surprising though that you know as a financial firm I thought it was actually a charity mm -hmm. that you would choose to give a hundred percent of the profits tell me about that decision because a lot of people don't understand abundance yeah I just got to a point where I am extremely blessed and was able to make some good decisions um, uh, with the money that I made playing basketball and um, just trying to give back and I think when you get to a certain point where you have you know you have investments that take care of whatever expenses you have I think you become a bit of you know it's it's just not right to continue to say more and more you know you're like a, a feudal lord like trying to accumulate all these things behind the walls of a castle it's like at some point you got to say what can I do to make this better um, so that's kind of where I'm trying to what I'm trying to get to and what I'm trying to do that's awesome now every successful person I, I say have miracles in their life other people call them mistakes yeah. as long as we learn those lessons they become miracles what was the biggest financial mistake that you made and what lesson did you learn you know I think this whole thing that I did it started off with like um, you know it's like almost fate um, I went through the process when I was 20 years old to to leave school and to go to the NBA draft and I get drafted and I'm trying to not be like all the other guys that make mistakes with their money and I went and I interviewed a number of financial advisors I found one that I thought was good he came to the house he met my mom took her out to lunch he was a family man everything like that I'm like all right I'm gonna go with this guy sounds great um, and I go through my first year I don't play that much and then I go and I actually come to Vegas and I come to Vegas with my buddy after the season and we stop in we're at the Palms Hotel are you 21 at least now I'm 21 I just turned 21 okay good yeah. at least you can have a good time in Vegas yeah exactly <laughs> but this was like the first good time that I would have right um, so we stop in front of the Palms Hotel and we see the owner of the hotel who also at the same time was owner of the Sacramento Kings Gavin he's yeah he said come on up and come to a party everything I'm like great you know we just got here we go up to the party and open the doors and it's it's great I mean it's like what you dream of it's like a 20 year old guy you know yeah. and I'm in there with my buddy and somebody hits me like in the back of the leg like somebody kicks me I'm like alright you know maybe I'm in the way let me move yeah. over a little bit and I move over and then somebody kicks me again and I'm like you know what, what is going on here and I turn around and I look and there's a guy sitting there and he's got his arm around two young girls and I look and I'm like it's kind of dark and then I look and it's my financial advisor the guy who I'm looking and that I you know I thought <laughs> oh, no. was this family, family guy, guy who took my mom out to lunch and I'm like if I go to that party if I don't see the guy in the yeah. you know five minutes later I show up or something like that so I was right there I knew that no one was going to take care of my money like I was going to and I saw that and I said you know what I thought this was like a you know somebody who was going to kind of look out for me and I was wrong so anyway I knew right then and there I had to kind of that was my Just mistake yeah. yeah well that's great now you know I'm telling people right now that I believe that our market's going to take a correction we've had sustained growth in our economy for so long that mm -hmm. I like to study history uh, 
in this matter because I believe human nature never changes. Great. And we can take advantage of things. And I've been through three corrections in my career and mm -hmm. have had money and have taken advantage of it and also made a huge mistake in 2008 with it. One of my objectives is going to be when the market turns, I'm going to do whatever it takes to get in front of Warren Buffett. And no matter what it costs me, time-wise, person-wise, that's going to be my only objective so I can ask him one question, which is going to be the same question I'm going to ask you. Okay. When the market goes down, what sh if, if I have money saved, right? Because I believe cashing up right now is important if, mm -hmm. for the correction. What should I do with my money? You should buy. Buy what? Do it's you time know? to buy. Buy an index fund, diversified index fund, low cost, tax efficiency. Um, yeah. I mean, when it goes down, and I think if you have, like you set up your- uh, You don't have to hit the bottom, right? Well, how are you going to know what the bottom is? Thank you. Good. I, that's you know? the point I want to get to. Good. So like if I have a portfolio that I've designed and I'm 40% risky assets, say, and the market crashes, then I'm down to 30%. Well, I'm going to buy and I'm going to buy so my asset allocation increases to 40%. So I'm going to try to find, I'm not going to think that I could pick the winners. I'm going to pick everything and I'm going to think that this thing is going to come back because history has shown that every time it does. I don't think I can necessarily time it and say, I would love to be able to do that, but <laughs> right, you know, as it continues to go down, I'll buy, you know, and hopefully I can buy towards the bottom. But yeah, I mean, that's that's going to be the time to buy. Absolutely. Now, last question. You know, you're on such a different journey than not just athletes, but successful people. You know, most people don't live in a world of more than enough. They don't believe in abundance mm -hmm. that, you know, they can literally, if I've had enough, now it's time to give back. And moreover, you're not only giving back, but you're giving back to impact others to impact others, right? You're yeah. changing history in effect by paying it forward for others to pay it forward. Mm -hmm. What legacy though would you want to leave you know, through this new business of yours? What's the true legacy that you'd like to leave? I just, I'd like to be able to be thought of as somebody who made a contribution to the betterment of society, whether it's you know, helping educate people financially, not on an individual basis, but through these two programs, helping sudden wealth recipients manage their money so then they can in turn go out and influence things for the better. So just someone that was um, interested in making a contribution. So I think you know that contribution can take place in many different ways, but making a contribution would be something that I'd be very proud to do. And what's the name, name of the company? Sweven Wealth. And what does Sweven mean? Sweven is an old English term, which I came up with after I was in England, but it's uh, a vision or dream. So it was my vision or dream to go out and to try and make this kind of thing where um, you know, I help people and contribute and, and do things like that. So, yeah. Well, that is awesome. And I will be sending a lot of my athletes this way. I appreciate and others that. And, uh, you know, I can't think of a better business to change our country and to put us back where we belong financially with right. the, uh, financial responsibility, which is, I think, something that's well needed. Awesome. Uh, for all levels of people, by the way. Yeah, for sure. So I really appreciate it. Appreciate me and you coming oh. on the playbook. Thanks, Thanks so a lot. much. I appreciate it. We got Troy Murphy, not only superstar NBA, Golden State Warrior since they're in the finals, but also an incredible entrepreneur and philanthropist with Dave Meltzer from Entrepreneurs, The Playbook.